Welcome to the Hashtag Proud to be LBUSD podcast series. I'm your host, Christopher J. Itson, and today on the show, we have Amy Becker from Millican High School, who is the lead teacher for the SEGA Pathway, which stands for Software Engineering and Gaming Academy, uh, which we're going to get to learn a lot about today in today's show. So hi, Amy. Thank you for joining us, and welcome to the studio. Hello. Thanks for having me. All right, so we, we usually start all these podcasts really getting to know our guest. Um, you know, our main focus, obviously, is the m- amazing work of your team, what's happening in your pathway. But let's start with you. So let's start by learning about your background as an educator and how you got to Millican and, and who are you at Millican? Okay. Um, well, I started off actually as a paralegal. And so I worked in law offices and I moved here from Ohio. And then I started um, 23 years ago teaching at Riley under an emergency credential. So um, I taught English and then I took some time off and I worked from home. And I um, owned a tutoring business for about 13 years and worked with the district that way. And just recently came came back to Lindbergh as the um, technology coordinator there. And I've been at Millican now for two years, my second year here. And I've been a part of Sega since then. Awesome. Awesome. And that's pretty crazy because you are a lead teacher, which we're going to explain to our audience a little bit today. And that's pretty yes. intense. Two years. So you've been a lead teacher both years or just... Um, no, uh, just this year. Okay. This year's my first year wow. as lead. In a pandemic. Yes. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> it's been interesting. <laughs> so for our audience members who may not know a little bit, what, let's talk a little briefly about what a link learning career co- co- pathway is and some of the components. Okay. Um, so linked, a linked learning pathway, um, it is set up with a consecutive, um, pathway of classes. So you have, you have, we have three classes that, um, follow each other in a sequence and all the skills build off of the year before. So in their 12th grade year, they have a capstone where they have their final culminating project that they, they present to industry professionals and get feedback from them. So awesome. they're taking what they're learning from all four years and really applying it to something that they can, um, they can take, uh, for their futures. That's so cool. I, I love that, that I heard someone explain the analogy one time or the example of, you know, in middle school, we used to have, you know, metal shop and wood shop and all these great classes that mm-hmm. are fantastic. And, um, but how is it really about this cursory knowledge? You've got these little introductory experiences where really what you're talking about more is building from discovery to mastery over the course of high school. Yeah. And, and um, it's great for the students to see like the real world applications of their learning. Um, but it's also really nice because we can um, recruit teachers who weren't traditionally um, teachers. They they had jobs in other careers and industries, and maybe they want to become teachers so they can get their CTE credentials, and then they can come and teach high school um, within a pathway, and they're experts in the subject matter. So it really helps a pathway to build um, their credibility with people who have experience in the work world. That's awesome. And I love you mentioned your capstone and having industry partners involved mm-hmm. in that, right? And so are there other ways that industry partners are involved, like specifically in your pathway? Yes. Um, we've been writing new courses for our pathway for the past couple of years. And we've had some industry professionals who have taken a look at our course outlines to make sure that the skills that we're teaching them are actually applicable to the to a job in mm-hmm. the future. Um, we want to make sure that we're teaching them something um, like for programming languages, that we're teaching them something that they can um, take and get a job after they graduate high school, or they can go into college and pursue it further if they want to do that. Um, And the really, the nice part about the link learning pathways is that all the students have options when they graduate. So they'll be able to earn certifications in programming languages for ours, um, but they'll also be able to have their A through G requirements. They can go to college, they can go to um, two-year, four-year colleges, they can go to a trade school. And so they have, they have many options after that. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. And so I want to dispel a myth because I've heard this lately yes. that, that I hear and I want to get your perspective as a, a lead teacher. So I'm in this pathway and you talked about there's certifications, maybe if I don't want to go to college, but there's also an opportunity for me to be focused on college. And you know, in our district, everyone, we strive for A to G completion for mm-hmm. students. Um, but do I can I take those honors classes and those AP courses and have those opportunities even though there's this CTE component to my pathway? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, this, the 
um, CTE course, just those courses basically um, just mean that they're linked together, that, that you're, you're going to continue your learning as you move forward in your CTE courses, um, and that they're a little bit more industry specific. So you could take a CTE course in graphic design, and then um, that's uh, applied more to the, um, those skills are applied more to that profession. Um, you could take a law course, an, an elective course, if you want to, and then you can um, you know, the, they'll have people teaching it that know something about the legal field. Um, and anybody can take any AP course in any pathway. And that's the really nice part about how everything is structured because there, um, there are students taking my, um, my video game design course in ninth grade, and they're also taking AP computer science. And um, we even have students from other pathways kind of coming in and taking the class because they're interested in it. That's really cool. That's mm -hmm. awesome. And, and I always think about that of, I remember starting my career and it was real, always kids, you know, where are you going to college? Where are you going to college? And I still push that. I, I, I went to college and mm -hmm. I'm assuming my, my daughter probably will someday. Um, but I also think about when we go back to really what's your post-secondary plan? What are you doing after this? What are those? So where's that college and career? And maybe it is that route, but it's, it's so great to have so many varied opportunities for students at, at this time in history, I think. Absolutely. And we even, I mean, last year I had a student in my class who, um, I was teaching a programming class, and um, he was going into the military. So he was kind of like, well, I don't really need this AP class, but I'm going to take it anyway. And so he wasn't all that into it. But then he had to take that ASVAB test that you have to take when you go into the military. Mm -hmm. And he said that he scored really high in the computer science part of it. So they were saying that they might assign him to computer science when he enrolls in the military. How so cool. you never know when it's going to come in, in handy. That's really cool. So let's take that further then, um, and let's go specific about your pathway. So what? tell me about SEGA. Let's tell, tell the audience really what the program is, what a benefit for students, what do they get to do? Okay. Um, in ninth grade, we have a video game design class, and uh, what we do is we learn about the design elements, um, and we learn about the um, process of um, the design process. Uh, as it relates to video games. So we start off with video games that they're already familiar with, mm -hmm. and they take those games and they kind of break them apart into their different elements. Mm. And then they create a game design document um, explaining all the different parts of that video game, um, just to demonstrate that they understand all these different parts. And they've been kind of amazed that so much thought goes into designing a video game because they... I don't know what they think when they first come <laughs> into it, but they're like, wow, this is really like formal and, you know, Complex the, and yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And then we go into um, the second semester of them creating their own game. So they get to design a game on their own. And so they take those elements that they learned in the first semester and they apply it to a game that they're creating. Wow. And so that's what we're doing right now. Actually, they just turned in their, um, their final game designs for their, for their um, unique projects. And then what they'll do um, next year, we leave 10th grade for them to explore. And so we want them to take different art classes, language classes. They get to add history to their schedule. Mm -hmm. um, we want them to take things like um, psychology because it could relate to AI. We want them to take other um, other subjects and get more experience in that because it will bring more to the um, to what they have to offer in their 11th grade year. Hmm. And then 11th grade, they um, the course is uh, video game development. So they take the game that they designed in ninth grade and they actually develop it using Unity. So Unity is a platform that um, we teach them the language of C Sharp. Um, and so they get to learn that and they can actually get certified in C Sharp um, at the end of the course. So they will have learned everything they need to wow. in order to do that. Um, and so they, that is a more of a pure programming course. Um, but we do, you know, throughout these courses, we do explore other elements that are involved with the industry. So we talk about hiring practices. We talk about um, biases and stereotypes in the characters of these games. We talk about kind of the tech techno masculinity that is involved mm. when kids are playing the games and um, you know how to approach those kind of things so we're we're trying to teach them a, a, a balanced approach to the to the game life um, and then in 12th grade their capstone course um, 
They take the game that they've developed and they're going to be presenting it to industry professionals for feedback. Um, but we're also going to talk about marketing and we're talking about esports as well and how esports has become um, hmm. or is becoming um, kind of a big part yeah, of it's like college um, scholarships now, right? <laughs> absolutely, yeah. We had a we had a team this year that went to CIF semifinals. Wow! And so it's really exciting to see it kind of explode. It's it's nice. I'm sorry to mean to cut you off. That's just it's so crazy no. to me. It's like. It's great, yeah. Like 30 years ago, and he was like, don't play video games, they'll rot your brain. And now yes. it's beyond an industry. It's got connections with college and its own sports network. Yeah, and- well, when you think about it, I mean, when when I first started teaching, I know we use computers to, you know, do word processing or, you know, we played the, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Uh-huh. You know, we were consumers. And now it's really nice to see that we've evolved so that we're, not just consumers, we're creators mm. of the content. And so we can teach our kids how to do that. A lot of them already know how to do that on their own when they come to the class. So that's that's kind of fun to see. Um, and one thing that the students don't really realize is how much gaming is involved in, in all sorts of industries. Um, I just did my Red Cross certification. I renewed it, and it's they have an online... Um, module that you can do. It's self-paced and it's a game. So you're going through scenarios and you have to kind of choose your own ending and um, and it's actually a video game. So um, it's used for training in different in different um, lines of work and, and it can apply to almost any career. And that is so cool because you think about it, you know, I mean, even before we, we sat down to talk and looking at the program and, you know, going on your website and kind of looking through some things and thinking, okay, I'm not a techie person, mm-hmm. which is funny. I work in the media services, but I have people <laughs> that do that kind of stuff. Sure. And I'm just not, it's just not my world. And so thinking about it, it's like, oh, this is programming and coding. And of course, but I mean, just even hearing you talk about issues with ethics and techno-masculinity and opportunities to be well-rounded by taking psychology and thinking where that connects with AI. Mm-hmm. And then even, and you brought it up and, you know, we always call them soft skills, but I think of them as 21st century skills, yeah. right? Or, and I heard an industry partner a while ago say game-changing skills, you know, if mm-hmm. we can teach our kids that, yes. just that on their own is going to set them off into a great place in the world. And so how Mm -hmm. cool that, I mean, these kids have, there's so many pathways. And I think that almost dispels the myth of like, oh, you're sticking this kid in this pathway. They're choosing this major in the ninth grade and that's all they're ever going to do. And you're like, no, this is just a thematic vehicle that maybe they're the kid that goes for it. Or maybe the kid that just leads them down a different path, but think of the skills they're getting. Yes. I know that a probably small percentage of my students are going to actually end up being game developers or game designers. But the students' interests, it's, it's so interesting how creative they are. And we have, we have students interested in the music aspect of game development, mm. in the artistry. There are some animators that are, that are in my classes mm. and um, people that are interested in the legal aspects of it with copyright law and, um, you know, contracts and other things mm. that are involved with the video game industry. So there are a lot of different ways that we can go with it, marketing. Um, and, so, and so it's really nice that if they, um, they can learn these skills of, you know, creating a business plan and all of these things that they that they want to do maybe for an industry, but they can apply it to something that they're really interested in now, which is game game design and game development. So is it a pretty popular program? I don't know if that's a dumb question right now, but just thinking of gaming being such a huge industry. Yeah, I, um, I think it's gotten, um, I think it's gotten some interest and I think we have a lot of eighth graders interested in our, in our program and we have, um, some students from other pathways and some older students kind of looking at the class and saying, Hey, can I take that one? <laughs> <laughs> Even though that's not really in their, um, you know, in their schedule right now. But, mm-hmm. um, so it's, it's been kind of fun to see that and to, um, to have, uh, our pathway teachers really embrace it and um, integrate some of those things into their classes too. So, and that's a big thing, right? And we kind of yeah. didn't get into that. When we were talking about the general uh, pathways, right. but the you know I, I've toured a lot of schools, and you have schools like Paramount Unified that has really amazing CTE programs, mm-hmm. um, or if you've been at Nashville Public Schools, is you know a national model for that. But it's all you do this in your CTE course, and anything to do with the rest of your day, where it's right. very different in Long Beach, right? Yeah. Absolutely. We have um, the ninth grade team that I work with. We work really closely together. Um, We have a science teacher who uses games to simulate um, some of the... um, like earthquakes and things mm-hmm. that happen in the classes. And then I take that same game after they played it in her class and we look at the design of the game oh, and cool. we say, did it, did it achieve the purpose that it, it was set out to achieve? 
Um, and then our English teacher uses, um, uses games in some of her essays that the students get to write about, um, about some things that have to do with, uh, with the stories that she's involved with, but in terms of video games. So, um, so we work really closely together and we're all, a few of us are learning, um, the programming language for unity so that we can integrate things even more. Wow. Um, there's a ton of physics involved with it and, you know, the science teachers, um, are really interested in, in getting involved. So. And that's so cool because you think, you know, that, that the, the intent I always felt like with that, with link learning is that if this is a student is heavily interested in that and it carries into the other parts of their yes. day. I mean, if I'm not a math student, but I'm realizing the relevance of math through this theme, then Absolutely. I'm going to want to be involved. So in that vein, and, and I was going to ask this later, but I think it kind of really lends to it now. Tell me about the collaboration between your team, your administrators, your counselors. I know we have a model in Long Beach that's very different where certain administrators and counselors are assigned to Pathways. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming the same at Millican. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little about what's the collaboration like and what's been the benefit for your kids? Yeah, we have um, we have a Pathway coordinator who kind of keeps all of the Pathway lead teachers um, apprised of uh, information from the district that we need to know or from the school that we need to know. So she's kind of our liaison. And then we have an administrator and a counselor who are assigned to our pathway. And so we've met every month. Um, we're called a triad. And mm -hmm. so we meet every month and we just talk about kind of what's happening and um, what we're intending to do the next month and um, just kind of work out any kinks that we might have. Um, it's been really nice because we kind of keep each other on track with um, with our vision and um, kind of keep the big picture in mind and we can kind of recalibrate if we need to. But um, especially with the pathway being so new, mm -hmm. um, we've had some bumps in the road that we've had to work out and it's been really nice to be able to collaborate with them. Yeah, and it's so complex, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you think about master scheduling, you think about cohorting, you think about those opportunities for thematic integration and yeah. where they fit in other content areas and that... It's this whole piece. And then I, yeah. I, I bet a lot of people don't really realize that. And you, you brought it up about that, going back to that vision and mission, that really pathways are, are designed to have a strong vision and mission, to have student outcomes tied to really ensuring we're supporting kids. And I always yeah. think of that fourth element of link learning, which is personalized student supports and how mm -hmm. that's why that you have that model. You have a dedicated counselor, dedicated administrator mm -hmm. that can wrap around kids. And it's that that village model. Mm -hmm. So you kind of sit, you, you really jumped on how excited you are about your teachers and mm -hmm. the things that they're doing. So yeah. what's that collaboration been like? Because I know that's a challenge. I mean, I, uh, you know, you're a history teacher and you're like, you're in an engineering pathway and they're right. like, okay. And some people, work? they get it, but yeah. some people, you know, it takes time. So yeah. what's that like for your team? Because it seems like you have some synergy happening. We're all learning. Yeah. And um, it's, it's been a process and then, you know, 2020 happened. So mm -hmm. it's, it's still a process, <laughs> 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 um, but we're working on it and, you know, slowly but surely everybody's, you know, coming around to the, the idea of what we're, what we need to, um, what we need to start doing next year and in the future. Um, our ninth grade team is again, the team that I'm a part of. And so we've, um, really worked closely this year because we got the students who came from eighth grade to ninth grade. They'd never been at the, at the high school before. Yeah. Um, and so we really, um, we met regularly online virtually to, um, just make sure that we talked about the students that we were, um, that we wanted to make sure had enrichment, um, materials that there may be more advanced. We didn't want them to get bored. Um, and then we had, and we talked about students that struggled and students that we might need to, um, have further supports for. Um, we had, um, we had, uh, I forget the word, um, uh, <laughs> conferences with the students all together. So we would meet with them on Zoom with the three of us and we would sit down and, and just really talk to them about what they need to do, but also what they needed from us. Um, and so then we could contact um, our counselors and um, and let them know kind of what we learned about them. And they were super responsive. Um, it was it was an, a nice experience. It was good for for the weirdest year in the world. Yeah. <laughs> it was um, it was a good good thing that came out of it. And that's, uh, it's so important, you know, those grade level teams and, you know, and, and, you know, the pathways we have now that kind of birthed out of just the idea of small learning community of small teams wrapping around kids. And I always think about that when I'd have a student and they're dealing with something and I don't really know how to approach them, but I always knew I could call my grade level team neighbors and say, hey, you're going to have the student next period. I don't know what's going on. Something's wrong. Yes. You know, something, they're dealing with something and you can find what's that entry point yep. to figure out what that student needs. And it sounds like you have that. Yes. So how are you doing? 
So you're only been at Millican two years. You're in the middle of transitioning <laughs> a pathway yes. and being one of the leaders in that work in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. It's been interesting. <laughs> it's kept me on my toes. Um, it's actually helped me a lot to stay focused and to say keep my structure of just kind of plowing through it. And um, but you know, taking the time for myself when I needed it. Um, the the expectations this year, I think we were we were given a lot of grace um, as far as our you know committee assignments and things like that mm-hmm. were concerned, but. Um, but I kind of – it helped me to have the work to, to stay focused. So, so it good, was good. I'm glad to hear. I, I, yeah. you, know, we were, you know, we were talking before we started mm-hmm. recording about that, about, you know, grace has become a buzzword, but it's so vital right now. And yeah. how teachers on, on the front lines actually having to figure out how to educate thousands and thousands of children. Yes. I mean, Canvas, you know, learning Canvas, mm-hmm. all of that stuff's intense. Yes. So did you get I, – I had um, – Michelle Tomiasen, who's part of uh, the business engagement um, team over at the district office, formerly LB Call, and she was talking a lot about how the stress of this year in not being able to do things, you know, for kids and how hard that was, but mm-hmm. then some of the benefit of being able to plan a little bit more. Yeah. How was that for you as a pathway lead? Did you have, I, I know you're still teaching all the time and yeah. your day didn't change, but did you have some time to conceptualize? And I mean, as you're all mapping out this new pathway? Yes. Um, and I think um, the shift t- uh, the shift towards uh, teachers learning more technology and being more involved with that has really helped. Um, and we've also been able to um, to create, uh, I know I, I spent some time this year creating a work-based learning plan hmm. um, to where we, we can outline the four years that the students are with us and how what types of exposure to careers that they're going to have. So we'll, we'll know in ninth grade in English class, they're going to have this type of exposure to this career. Mm. And then maybe in their history class in 10th grade, they're going to get, you know, mock interviews or some other type of, of practice towards work-based learning. So that's been really nice to be able to kind of create that work-based learning plan this year. Um, and then, um, you know, and just writing the courses, I'm still writing the third mm, course. So it's fun. Been... <laughs> <Seems forever>. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but it's been great. And I've gotten some good support from the district. Um, thank you, Miriam. <laughs> yes. Miriam, Miriam's amazing, right? Having that yes, CT office that she's amazing. just ma- helps you map it out. <laughs> oh, it's been great. So, um, and that's been a lot of fun. So I, I've been glad to be able to do that and then get, getting input for, um, from our teachers to do that. So I had to. Um, you know, we had to we had to sit down at one, at our meetings and discuss um, what are you currently doing, and then where do we hmm. need to take that in the future. And everybody was great. Um, they were really open about what what they did, or if they didn't do anything, what they could do in the future, and so we could take that and really shift it towards the future. That's cool. And I know I mean, you talked about real world experience at the beginning and stuff. Work based learning is so powerful, but. I think it's easy for work-based learning to, to become, oh, we have this guest speaker, great. But when you're talking more, where you're talking about, let's be a little bit more methodical about a surgical and say, what do they need in the ninth? What do they need in the 10th? And how are mm-hmm. we building them to those greater experiences that that go from exposure to actually real experience? Absolutely. Well, okay. So let's talk about the transition. Because I know you said it's only been two years. And I know yes. the program was formerly called MIT. And even a few years before that, it had a, a th- I can't remember nowadays. I think it was Global Tech or something yes. like that. It had changed over time. Uh-huh. Um, what... What were some of the reasons for change, you know, and and you and I were talking prior, and so we'll Mm -hmm. add this in about, um, you know, the whole world's talking about equity now, and our district's really committed to really looking at our inequities and how are we changing those things Mm -hmm. and supporting all kids. So, I don't know, let's delve into that. There's this transition, you you know, did you walk in after the transition and you were like, surprise, I'm going (laughs) to lead this. I didn't have anything. What's that been like? Um, uh, okay, so so I was at Lindbergh. I loved my job at Lindbergh um, as tech coordinator, but I was at TOSA, and um, I wanted something a little bit um, more stable uh, as an, a, a teaching job, a regular teaching job. Mm-hmm. So um, I was looking to change. Both of my girls um, are at Millican or were at Millican at that point. So um, so I I put in put in my resume and um, I, I got the job. And just as I was getting the job, they let me know that they're just in the process of changing the pathway. Hmm. So they changed the name and they changed the focus that year, but that they wanted me to work with them to write these courses hmm. and to um, kind of eventually take the lead and, and, um, and take it to the next step. So, um, 
Phil Ostenbrado was the lead teacher then, and he works with, closely with, with me now. He's involved with esports, and um, he's he's been a great resource in making that shift. And he, Shout out to Phil. Phil's awesome. He is great, and he, um, he builds such a, a great sense of community with the kids and the teachers, and he's, he's really good at that part of it. So, <laughs> so um, thank you, Phil. Uh, but we had... Um, Part of the benefits of linked learning is that students have choice. And um, in our pathway system, um, we want the students to be able to choose something that they're interested in, um, no matter what their ability levels are, no matter what their grade point average is, no matter, you know, no matter who they are. So um, so if they're interested in something, we want them to be able to be engaged and to, to, um, to take those classes. So um, one of the problems when the pathway was MIT was that students didn't have the choice to be there. Um, the students, it was previously organized that students didn't need um, a certain grade point average to get into MIT. Sorry. Um, and the other pathways they did. Mm -hmm. And so um, we had a lot of students that, that maybe weren't into it. Uh, and so they were just kind of put there and so they, they weren't engaged and, um, I, I feel bad for them. I, <laughs> I wish they would have been able to have a choice. And so now, um, students have a choice. We have a laureate program. So advanced students that want to, um, that are interested in these, um, subjects, they can join our pathway. Um, I've heard from some students in, um, in, uh, other pathways uh, that they kind of felt they had, they these students had like 4.0 grade point averages and they um, were older students and they had felt the pressure to go into those pathways because of their grade point average. Mm -hmm. And they kind of expressed to me that they had wished that they had been able to go into a pathway based on their interests rather than just their grade point average. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's going to afford those students a lot of opportunities and um, the ability to take some fun classes and not be locked out of those because the um, pathway students get first uh, dibs on the classes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that um, because they're choosing to be there, then they can, they'll have a um, more of a sense of pride, more of a sense of belonging. Um, we've already seen students that are, are really engaged. We have some sophomores that are just, they want to be a part of everything. Mm. And, <laughs> and they have, you know, these lofty goals and they <laughs> want to help other kids. And it's just really incredible to that's see cool. when they get energized about it. And it's cool because that's, well, I mean, this pandemic has been going on yeah. for the majority of that time that you're talking about. And so to know that there are students that are exciting, that's that's wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think we're seeing that more across the district, right, is that there's there's a lot of misconceptions about CTE and even link learning and stuff. And it's not perfect. And it's always evolving. And I think mm -hmm. back when I started in this district and it was academies and SLCs that it looks so it's a different universe, yes. you know, at this point. But really, it, more and more those programs, like you have a laureate program. I know Cabrillo has a similar program, like mm -hmm. what is a similar program in other schools where it's, you can do both. You can yeah. have these opportunities to take these rich AP classes and be prepared for going to a foreign university. But at the same time, what you let, you know, you want to code, and you want to build a video game, right. and you have that opportunity. And I think it's yeah. cool to hear that you're building that foundation. So was there any challenges in that? I mean, obviously the pandemic, but is there any challenges in... Think, thinking through that, any any barriers you all ran into, or I think it's just um, I think it's uh, the because of those challenges with the previous pathway, there was a stigma associated with the pathway, mm. and so I I think from seeing the enrollment numbers from eighth grade coming into ninth grade, I think people are understanding mm. that um, it's it's you know we we've, we've changed everything. Um, and I think another challenge has been, you know, um, having teachers understand kind of what software engineering is. Mm. And I mean, it's a whole new, a whole new world and that we don't, you know, we don't need them to teach programming, mm -hmm. but, but that, um, there are concepts within programming and design that they could integrate into their classes. And kind of that's where we are now, where we're, we're exploring those things and, um, learning how these concepts can be integrated into all this, all the subjects. And that's like, to me, the foundation, if, if you don't have that element working for you with your, your buy-in and your staff, it's yeah. so hard because it is intimidating. If, if I'm a master English teacher who's been teaching for 15 years and it's like, <laughs> 
add programming in. And you're yeah. like, what? <laughs> like, I, I don't know what that is. And just the intimidation of that. So right. it sounds like you have some willing willing team members and I, and it really it's that collaboration, right? Yeah. That you're, you're, you feel safe because you're doing it together. Absolutely. Yeah, we're all in the same place. We're all learning. And then, especially in, you know, this year, everything has gone up in the air again. Yeah, so, of course. So, but I think it's opened people up to learning new things because they saw that they could during the pandemic. Mm. They learned Canvas and they learned all sorts of new skills that they're going to use. And um, so hopefully the growth mindset has taken hold mm-hmm. and <laughs> we'll go forward. I always wonder about that because now we have, you know, our whole offices. I remember the 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 day before or a couple days after we closed down and Mr. Steinhauser was like, you're going to run Zoom. And I was like, what's Zoom? <laughs> Not for the district, but for yeah. our, our broadcast and right. everything and the board meetings. And I'm like, okay. And our team sat down and figured out. And thinking back, that seems lifetimes ago now where it's like, yes. oh, yeah, this is something we use all the time. And how right. are we going to still, like you were saying, how are we going to integrate that still into work? Because now we have this arsenal or this extra tool belt yes. that a lot of us were either anywhere from – just didn't know or unfamiliar to mm-hmm. terrified of. Right. So now everyone's kind of, you know, in that fold of, well, crash course in this stuff. So yeah. how is it going to enhance when we're back in person completely? Absolutely. So I guess really let, just finish with, is there anything that I didn't ask you or, or that you want to bring up about plugging your program or events or things going on? This is your, your chance. Um, gosh. Well, I think I've already said I'm proud of the esports team, but <laughs> Proud of the esports team. They did a great job. That's awesome. Um, and no, I just um, it's it's been really nice to to be a part of this team that's taking on this challenge and growth and craziness in this year. But um, but it's exciting to be a part of it and then to see to be able to plan where we're going from here. So I'm I'm grateful to be a part of it. Awesome. Well, thanks, Amy. Thank you. Mm-hmm.